Well, welcome to this edition of The Stand Radio on this Mother's Day weekend. It is a great time uh, to consider the blessings and the importance of motherhood. We wanted to start off the program today by thinking of a unique aspect of motherhood that you might not have considered, and that is the ministry aspect of motherhood. Amanda Chris is a wife and mother of two who's living on a small farm in Mississippi. She's written an article in this month's Stand magazine titled The Inefficient Ministry of Motherhood, and she's with us to share her thoughts. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to the Stand Radio. Hi, thank you so much. Why don't we start off by uh, you telling us just a little bit about your family. You're a mother of two. Tell us about your kids. That's right. Okay, I have a son and a daughter. Um, and I homeschool them. So they're both in elementary school at this point. Uh, My husband's name is Jody, and we uh, live on his family's old farm. And so when when we got married, we uh, moved to the family farm, um, and we've moved. uh, We've lived in Alabama, and we've lived in uh, South Mississippi uh, during our marriage. But at this point, we're back in North Mississippi, and uh, I spend most of my time homeschooling the kids and working here at the home. Yeah, I know it it must be exciting, two little kids on a farm. I can't imagine anything that could be (laughs) more exciting than that. Amanda, what what particular challenges uh, do you face as a mother that maybe you didn't expect to have before you had children? Um, I think in the early, very, very early stages of being a new mom, the exhaustion was, um, I, I knew that there would be some sleepless nights. I understood that, <laughs> to expect that, but just the, 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 um, the depth of the, um, just being physically worn out, um, mm-hmm. was a challenge that I, I really, um, it, it wore on me a lot more than I had expected. Uh, another challenge that i began to deal with um, really during my pregnancy with my um, my firstborn, my son, was a lot of fear and anxiety. Okay. That um, And, and I, I still deal with that through now. Just something I had never really um, dwelt on much before motherhood or thought that I thought that I dealt with before mm-hmm. I was a mom. And um, that just seemed to come rushing in. And it's something that I still deal with and, and have to bring before the Lord on a daily basis. Um, but also, um, I've often faced a nagging sense um, as a mom of being shelved by God from, I'm going to say, quote, unquote, real ministry hmm. now that I'm a mom. So the work of being a mom felt so physical. Before we had kids, I was um, involved in Bible studies and uh, did volunteer work and spent a lot of time with other Christians up either at the church or, or doing ministry work, things that felt very spiritual. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the work of a mom is just so physical, so mundane, so redundant, hmm. and it often didn't feel very spiritual at all. And so I tend to be have the type of personality that loves to read productivity books. Um, or, or you know all the articles about habits and time management, but those haven't always dovetailed very neatly into trying to be a faithful mother. Um, I would say though, I think at some point um, I've had a, a mindset shift over the last few years. So I've been a mother now for 12 years, um, and I've had a mindset shift, and I think it's really a conviction um, that offering my my body, my exhaustion, my my hands, my energy. Um, I would say the best years of my life or my youth, to offer that for whatever it is that God brings into this day, that is the spiritual work He's given me because I'm offering it to Him. And and Romans 12, 1 is what I'm thinking of here, where Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, your very bodies, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So because I belong to Christ, if the work He gives me feels lowly, then all the better opportunity to imitate him. And that's what you addressed in the article, which I think you did so well. Mm. Now, you use the word inefficient, inefficient, uh, when describing the ministry of motherhood. I thought that was a curious word. Why did you choose uh, that particular word to describe motherhood? Sure. Maybe the term inefficient first came to mind um, because I was thinking about there were times that I needed to turn down bigger or grander sounding ministry opportunities, or even say no at times to ways to be more involved in church or in Bible studies in order to say yes to being a faithful mom. Um, I could find myself reasoning that if I were um, teaching a large class or serving and volunteering to a large group of people, that then I'm impacting 20 or 30 people at a time, maybe more, maybe less, whereas 
to sit at my kitchen counter with my own two kids who need to be corrected to stop, you know, kicking each other under the table or, you know, clean up the milk and and Mm -hmm. told not to, you know, not to hop up. (laughs) This seemed a lot less efficient use of my time. And also the fruit of labor like that is a longer time in coming. So two two weekly kids don't really give you a feeling of having joined the Lord in real kingdom work, (laughs) like teaching a class of appreciative and spiritually minded adults would. Uh, But on on that idea of efficiency or inefficiency, um, I I do believe it's important for maybe especially for people like me who are driven um, to remember that God hasn't charged us to be the most efficient. He's charged us or called us to be faithful. And I think there are a a lot of ways as a mom uh, and really it's, just in any male, female, um, at any stage of life that we could consider this idea of inefficiency because faithfulness to God just often doesn't look like efficiency from our perspective. So, um, you know, you're reading a storybook to your seven month old and they're, you know, a little, they're flipping the little hard pages and they're probably not going to ever remember that. Um, you cook a warm meal. It's just going to be consumed and eaten up. Um, and it's going to be, People are going to want snacks or another <laughs> another meal very soon. And none of this feels highly spiritual or even very fulfilling. And so that would be kind of an example of, of where uh, motherhood often seems like it's a very inefficient, cumbersome sort of uh, work. Uh, and it feels like we're not getting down to the, to the more spiritual aspects um, in, in every single moment. But, you know, if we consider how Jesus... Um, if we consider Jesus in the Gospels, we don't find, it surprises me sometimes how we don't find him prioritizing efficiency. Um, just a few examples of this um, that have been meaningful to me would be, one would be if we consider the Sunday afternoon when Jesus rose from the dead. So he's risen from the dead that morning. You would think that that afternoon he could have gathered crowds like nobody's ever seen. He's, right. he's just risen from the dead. But instead, Luke 24 tells us that we find him ministering to two obscure disciples on the road to Emmaus. He's with two people that we don't really know much about. Um, you see in Mark 10, where Jesus's kingdom-driven disciples are sending away the children because Jesus had, quote, real ministry to do. <laughs> so when the parents brought the, the, the children to Jesus, the apostles brushed away the kids and their parents. But but whom did Jesus rebuke? It wasn't the children. It was the apostles who had these grandiose kingdom dreams. Yeah. And I see this. It's a, hard, it's a hard thing to wrap my mind around, but I see this throughout Scripture. I consider some of the Lord's most faithful servants. You consider John the Baptist or mm-hmm. all the apostle or James, the brother of John. We see their imprisonments or their sufferings. And from a human perspective, it feels like a waste. Yeah. But um Backing up and considering that this is the economy of God's kingdom, where the way up is down and the cross is the path to resurrection and glory, um, it's it's inefficient from a human standpoint, but it's um, perfect uh, yeah. and the way that God gets the glory when we consider what's true. Yeah, that's very good. Um, Amanda, in your article, The Inefficient Ministry of Motherhood, uh, you relate the life of a mother to one of uh, entering figuratively into the grave with Christ. Why did you choose that particular metaphor? Mm. There's a quote that has blessed me a lot over the last decade or so. It's by Elizabeth Elliot, and she said, Settle it once for all. We can never lose what we have offered to Christ. We live and die in Him, and there is always resurrection. So the reason I use the analogy of entering into the grave with Christ is because dying with Christ and living with Him in resurrection life, this is the Christian life. Galatians 2.20, I think, sums this up really well. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Um, my uh, My dad died six months ago after having lived for over four years with a terminal diagnosis. Um, And one of the last things that he was able to say to me, he he actually had to spell it out due to his condition, but one of the last things he spelled out using his alphabet board was, 
we will be together again. Wow. And so this this has been my my life for the last few years and my family's life is is walking this road with my dad. And I wrote this article really in view of living the Christian life, anticipating the resurrection. It's become real to me in a way that that impacts I think impacts my daily life in a way it would have not before. So, it, you know, if we belong to Christ, our, our death is His. Our suffering, our moments, our time all belong to Him. So every time we have a chance to die to self or to go lower, Elizabeth Elliot talks about how um, wherever the will of God, um, and I'm not quoting it exactly, but where the, the, the sovereignty of God crosses the will of our flesh, that's our opportunity to die. That's our chance to go lower. <laughs> and so whenever motherhood, which it does often, when it affords us this opportunity where we can say by our actions, we're essentially saying, my life for yours. Now we're imitating Christ. We're taking up our cross. We're keeping in step with a king who leads us into a burial that culminates in resurrection. Yeah. Um, John 12, uh, John 12, verses 24 through 26, um, I think probably this is uh, the crux of, of what where I'm coming from. And Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So alone, without dying, it's just a kernel of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus says, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, Jesus says, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. And then he says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. We see this pattern in Jesus' life of suffering and death and then glory. And it's the pattern for us, too, walking, keeping our eyes on Jesus um, but there's a coming reward. There's a coming. Um, there's a coming glory for those of us who are in Christ, who are really on the road to resurrection. Yeah. So, if we believe this, whether we're a man or a woman or whatever our current stage of life is, if we believe this, why not freely spend and be spent for our Lord? Now, this is this is hard. <laughs> I'm talking about something and it, it, that I feel like I see, I, I, I say this, and yet I see a discrepancy in my own life between what I, where I want to be and what I know is true, and yet where I struggle in my own flesh. Right. But as mothers of young children, we we have a golden opportunity at this time of our lives to take hold of Jesus's promise for we could say burrowing grains mm-hmm. or um, buried grains of wheat to yield a harvest. I couldn't resist asking this final question uh, to you, Amanda. What is it about motherhood that gives you the greatest joy? When you look across the, the whole spectrum of everything that you're doing uh, there with your two kids on the farm, uh, what is it that just really just fills your heart with joy uh, in your role as a mother? Yeah. You know, I've talked about, uh, we've talked here about mothering and then the challenges with being a mother, but, but being a mother is such a gift. And, and I love, I love being a, a mother. Um, my husband and I were not able to have children for several years. And then we've also miscarried twice. I think this has given me a very helpful perspective on the hard days as well as the good days. It gives me a, a perspective of what a gift it is to have children and to be a mom. Um, but I would have to say that primarily my greatest joy is, is knowing that at this point in my children's lives, um, the Lord's heard our cries, my mm-hmm. husband's cries and, and my prayers too, for our kids' salvation and that they're trusting Christ for themselves. So on the hard days or when I get real anxious about my kids or the future, this is a perspective that gives me so much joy and comfort. And again, <laughs> it's because of the resurrection, because yeah, like my dad said, uh, regardless of, of what the day brings or, or the future brings, um, for those who are in Christ, we will be together again. Once again, the title of the article is The Inefficient Ministry of Motherhood by our guest, Amanda Chris. It's in this month's The Stand magazine. Amanda, thank you so much for your encouragement and your insight into the inefficient ministry of motherhood. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. 